You are listening to audio from Citizens Church Elmira. You can find more resources and learn more about our church at citizensalmira.ca. Um, good morning, everybody. Happy first Sunday of Advent. Um, I don't know about you, but I feel like uh, this season has kind of snuck up on me uh, this year. Um, but I'm glad that some, uh, some folks here have planned uh, an event for us to enjoy this evening to kind of kick off the Advent season uh, together and to remind us to just kind of slow down and enjoy this time leading up to Christmas. Um, over the past few years, I've found it really enriching um, to intentionally celebrate this season of anticipation and expectation in the weeks uh, leading up to December 25th, rather than just letting the whole month uh, whiz by. Now, one of the first ways that we often mark the Christmas season is by putting up our Christmas lights, right? Uh, the first year uh, that uh, Sharice and I lived in our new house, uh, we didn't put up any lights on the outside of the house. Uh, we just had the Christmas tree in, in our big front window, um, and that was all lit up. Um, but last year, I decided that, you know, we should have some Christmas lights on the outside. So went to Canadian Tire, grabbed a strand for the eaves trough and a few strands for um, the tree that's in our front yard. And yesterday, Dad came over uh, with the ladder truck from his shop, and uh, we put up those lights. It's really handy to have a father who has access to things like a ladder truck, so you can do these sorts of things. But I was really excited to get that done yesterday in time for this first Sunday of of Advent. Um, I just really enjoy in December coming home from work. Usually it's after dark because the sun is setting so much earlier these days. Um, and coming around the corner and just seeing the front of the house lit up and that, and that tree um, with all of those, those lights in it. Uh, it's really uh, fun to see those little LEDs piercing the darkness around them. And uh, part of the reason I enjoy it is because light at Christmas time is not only just decorative, it is symbolic, right? Um, the way that those little LED lights or candles in a dark room pierce the darkness uh, is kind of symbolic of our Lord. He is our light, piercing through the darkness in our world and guiding us home. And when we think of Jesus as our light around this time of year, scriptures that often come to mind are like ones um, like that at the beginning of John, which reads, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and in him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Or we think of Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2, that says, The people walked, who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shone. But actually, as we take a look in our passage this morning, and if you haven't turned there already, do that now. Turn to Mark chapter 4. Um, as we start that, as we look at the start of our um, passage, starting in verse 21, we see another place in Scripture where Jesus is portrayed as light. Although, if you were looking at that Scripture this morning, it's maybe not as obvious as some of these other passages. So looking in uh, Mark chapter 4, starting in verse 21, this is what we read. And he said to them, Is a lamp brought in to be put under a basket or under a bed and not on a stand? For nothing is hidden except to be made manifest, nor is anything secret except to come to light. Now, I'm not an expert in the original Greek that these scriptures were written in, um, but I read in several places from people who are experts in Greek um, something interesting about this verse. So Mark actually uses the definite article to refer to the lamp. In, in this verse. So we could actually read that first verse 21 as, and he said to them, is the lamp brought in? So if he's speaking of a particular lamp, it's likely that he's referring, Jesus is referring to himself. He is the lamp that is being brought in to give light to the house. He is the, he is the light and his intention is not uh, to remain hidden. He has come to bring this light into the world, to bring understanding to our confusion, and to bring the healing word of God to broken people. And one, one way that we consistently see Jesus bringing God's light into the world in the Gospels is through his verbal teaching. And as we pick up in Mark chapter 4 here, where Darcy left off last week, that's exactly what we find him doing. He's teaching. And in this instance, 
he seems to be teaching beside the Sea of Galilee. In verse, uh, verse one of chapter four, we read that he actually got into a boat and stood at the boat while everybody else was on land and he taught from there. And he taught with many parables, as Darcy ex- explained last week. And this decision to teach in parables was a strategic one. It was strategic on the part of Jesus to kind of draw people in to this story, to teach using analogies and comparisons that they could relate to, but also to teach in a way that kind of encouraged or forced people to to not just take in the teaching, but to, to think about it, to kind of stretch their minds a little bit, to figure out what was the principle that he was getting at, all with the intention of drawing people in and revealing the truth about God's kingdom. These parables weren't about speaking in code and hiding the truth. It was about pushing people to seek and to think more deeply about these things. These parables aren't about keeping people in the dark. They're about drawing people into the light. But if we're going to learn from these things, we have to be willing to step into the light. And just before Mark uh, is going to record a couple more uh, parables in in Mark chapter 4 that have an agricultural theme, hence the bag of seed, he actually records a warning um, from Jesus or an admonition in verses 23 to 25. And it starts with a phrase that we heard uh, last week in the earlier part of the chapter, and then it goes on. And Jesus said, starting in verse 23, if anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. And he said to them, pay attention to what you hear. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you and still more will be added to you. For to the one who has, more will be given. And from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. Now some call this passage, this section, the parable of the measure. Um, But it's really more of a principle than a parable. The idea that Jesus seems to be getting at here is basically uh, the same as what I used to hear my university professors say at the beginning of our courses. They would say something along the lines of, in this course, you're going to get out of it what you put into it. The idea being that if you're willing to spend some effort and engage with the material in front of you, you're going to reap the rewards of that investment. You will learn more and you will find the course more engaging. On the contrary, if you decide at the outset that the course is going to be dull, unengaging, and a general waste of time, you're likely to be right. And there's a parallel here with individual spiritual growth. There's a sense in which we get out of it what we put into it. In the face of confusing and hard passages in in scripture or, or spiritual truths, if we don't press in and pursue understanding, these things are likely to continue to remain a mystery to us. But if we're willing to be drawn in and to invest in our own spiritual development by the grace of God, we will find our capacity to learn and to understand these things to grow and increase. We know that Jesus is ready to show himself to us. We've already seen that in this uh, introduction to the passage about the light and the light shining in the darkness. He's the lamp that has come, not to be hidden under a basket, but to be put on its stand so that it can illuminate and reveal. He wants to teach. This is what Mark 4 is all about but we must be willing to invest the time to learn. Jesus will teach us to the degree that we are willing to listen. This is why he says in a few places throughout this chapter, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. So together this morning, let's, let's lean into the light. Let's consider what he has to say to our hearts and trust that he's going to be faithful to teach us. So in general, um, these parables, again, that we see in in Mark chapter 4, they all have similar themes. They use analogies from agriculture, sowing seeds, growth, and harvest. All of these things explain different aspects of the kingdom of God. Jesus uses them to explain what it looks like when God is in charge, when he reigns. Now, there are three major parables in in this chapter. Darcy covered the first one last week, and then we're going to look at the second two this week. So first we had the parable of the sower and the soils and and its interpretation in the first 20 verses of Mark chapter 4. And then next um, we have the parable of the seed growing in verses 26 to 29 of the chapter. And then finally we have the parable of the mustard seed in verses 30 to 32. Now naturally with the similarities in all of these parables and their themes, there's going to be some overlap in the ideas, right? They're all agricultural parables, so there's some 
there's some commonality between them. So you might this morning hear echoes of the sorts of things that Darcy was getting at last week, um, but some repetition can be helpful, right? Like hearing concepts repeated over and over again can help to solidify things in our minds. But also, um, these parables uh, that we're looking at this morning, they come with these similar themes, but they look at them in a, from a slightly different angle. So repetition helps to sort of cast these things in our minds so we remember them. Um, but the different angle that we look at the kingdom of God can help to round out the picture of it. And in this case, it's helping us to round out this picture of the kingdom of God and what it's like when it grows. And as we, as we look at these parables this morning, I thought it might be helpful to have a visual representation in front of us. So hopefully you picked up some of these seeds on your way in. And as we go through these parables, maybe just take a moment to kind of look at them. Consider the size of the seed. Consider what will happen when it gets planted and grows. Thanks uh, to Brett and Jocelyn for uh, this, letting us borrow this seed this morning. Um, uh, once we're all finished, you can feel free to dump your seed back in the bag on your way out, because I think Brett and Joss have some plans for it next spring. So um, we can just make sure they get that back. I said, uh, I said a moment ago that Mark, in Mark chapter 4, these parables are all about the kingdom of God. They're about um, teachings of Jesus that explain what the kingdom is like. And again, this morning we're going to focus in on the theme of kingdom growth. What is it like when God's rule and reign is allowed to grow and expand? What's it like when his way of thinking, his way of loving, his way of living covers more ground? Both in our individual lives and minds and hearts, but also in our community here and in the world at large. And this morning we're just going to look at two principles of kingdom growth. First, Kingdom growth can be facilitated, but it can't be fabricated. And second, kingdom growth is expansive, but it's not always explosive. So let's start in uh, verses 26 uh, through 29 with this first parable, the parable of the seed growing. And it says that Jesus said to them, the kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. He sleeps and rises night and day, and the seed sprouts and grows, and he knows not how. The earth produces by itself first the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. But when the grain is ripe, at once he puts the sickle, because the harvest has come. Now this parable starts out much the same as the parable of the sower in the earlier chapter, uh, in the earlier parts of the chapter. It begins with this man scattering seed on the ground, planting it in the first place. But while the first parable focused on the quality of the soils, this parable focuses on the actual process of growth itself. Kingdom of, the kingdom of God grows like a farmer grows grain. The main idea in this parable is the relative passiv passivity with which the grain grows. The key phrases are in the middle of these verses. The seed sprouts and grows, but he knows not how. And the earth produces by itself. Ultimately, the point is that the growth is not manufactured by the farmer. The forces which combine together to actually cause this growth, the rain, the sunlight, the summer air, they are at the end of the day outside of the control of the one who sows the seed. He cannot fabricate the growth in himself. He relies on natural processes to take their course and to move the seed from germination through to flowering and ripening. So it is with the kingdom of God. We do not cause the growth of the kingdom. We don't fabricate it. God is the agent that propels it forward. Certainly, we can participate in it, but we cannot cause the growth any more than a farmer can cause photosynthesis. Now, it's not as though the farmer does nothing, and it's not as though we are completely unaware of what's going on through the process of growth as, as a seed matures into a plant. You know, Jesus says there, but he knows not how. Now, I think Adam Brown, who's been studying plant science for the past few years, might take issue if I tried to say that we humans were completely ignorant of what was going on in that process of growth. Like, agricultural science isn't exactly a new field of research. Humanity has been at it for a while, and we all at least kind of understand on a basic level what's going on and that we can do things to help improve um, the yield of crops or we can improve... Um, the, the growth of the plant. Darcy kind of touched on this last week when we discussed the soils. There's things that we can do to prepare our fields, you know? Whether we have a few planters in our backyard at home or whether we're tilling 100 acres, there are things that we can do, right? 
tilling, weeding, watering, fertilizing. These things help facilitate growth, but at the end of the day, they don't fabricate it. Before Sharice and I were married, um, I actually rented a room in, in Brett's farmhouse for a couple years out in Yatton. And during that time, on different occasions, I can remember um, picking his brain about agricultural, agricultural things every now and again. You know, it's a, it's a world that I've kind of always known growing up in Elmira at, at an arm's length, but I've never had like real upfront personal experience with it. Um, and so it was kind of interesting to, to learn from an expert in the field a little bit and, and talk about these, these things. And I can remember, you know, talking about things like ideas for changing, um, you know, the setup of his tile drain system so that he could thread the needle between draining the fields early so he could get on there with a the tractor to, to till and to plant, but then also retain enough moisture to promote that germination and the growth. And yesterday, um, when I, I went out to grab this bag of seed from him, and Brett was telling me about how he often thinks about, as he farms, like there's so many analogies for the gospel in what he's doing. He thinks about it every season when he goes to plant. Um, and particularly, we were talking about this concept of trusting God to do the work. And, and Brett commented that, yeah, like there's all sorts of things that they do to prepare their fields. Um, he tills the land, he applies the fertilizer, but ultimately, once that crop is in the ground, they just wait. That's all they can do. Wait and trust for God to provide the rain and to provide the sunlight. And there's all sorts of modern technologies in the world um, which can even help him get more yield out of, out of his crop, you know, even on tough soil. There's better designed seed. There's more effective fertilizer. We could even install, you know, very precise irrigation systems. But at some point, we just have to wait for nature to do what nature does, for that seed to germinate, to sprout, to bud, to flower and ripen. And so it is with the kingdom of God. We can do all sorts of things to facilitate kingdom growth, but we don't fabricate it. It's the work of the Lord. Maybe it's an individual person we're investing in. Um, we're walking with them. We're praying for them. We're desiring that they would see Jesus more clearly, that they would love him more dearly, and they would follow him more nearly. We might scatter the seed of gospel in their lives, um, but it's not our power contained within that tiny little seed. It's not our power that's ready to germinate. It's the power of God's love. It's his goodness, his sacrifice that's ultimately going to sprout up. And the same goes for the growth of the kingdom on a community level. If this church that we planted together, if citizens grows up into a mature community of faith that introduces people to Jesus and we get to observe transformation in their lives, the ultimate power behind that growth will not be because we hired the right pastor who preached the right sermon, we were in the right missional family, and we had the right display of hospitality to our neighbors. These things help facilitate places for God's light to shine, but ultimately they aren't the things that are catalyzing the growth. That's the work of the Lord. Paul echoes this when he writes to the Corinthian church. What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything but only God who gives the growth. And all of this that we've kind of hammered over and over again this morning, it's God that causes the growth. It got, it's God that causes the growth. It's God that causes the growth. This does two things for us. It keeps us humble and it relieves the pressure. If we are ever tempted to think that it's something that we said or a prayer that we prayed or some sort of shining example that we were that changed someone, this parable corrects us. If we're ever tempted to think that it's a strategy our church adopted, a dynamic leader we hired, or a program we developed that changed the community and was the tipping point for transformation, this parable grounds us back in reality. The remind, this reminder will help us keep our pride in check, but on the other hand, it can also relieve pressure from us. God's work in the world and in your family, it's not dependent on you. We're not responsible to make all of this growth come to be. Yeah, we need to till the soil, we have to plant the seed, and we should water it faithfully, but God causes the growth, and we can rest in him to do his work. We must and sometimes that can be a challenging thing to do, to just release control and trust in God. The other thing I can remember Brett talking about when I lived at his place was, was the mindset of some of the other farmers that, that he knew. I recall him saying that he knew men and families who were just obsessed with work, production, yield. 
constantly taking on more and running at an unsustainable pace, not taking the time to rest. Just work, work, work. We got to work. We got to make more. I also remember at the time reading up a bit on something called uh, precision agriculture, which is an approach to agriculture that uses a lot of modern technologies, you know, like GPS guidance, drones, sensors, soil sampling, precision machinery, all to grow crops more efficiently. It actually has some pretty neat techniques. I thought it was quite interesting. Um, fundamentally, it's focused on minimizing inputs and maximizing outputs. It gives the farmer detailed insight and greater control to maximize his yield. But is that what the kingdom of God is like? Turning every possible dial, controlling every possible thing, investing as little as possible to achieve the result? I don't think it is. Precision agriculture isn't bad, don't get me wrong. Strategic thinking, intentional effort, thoughtful ministry, I think is God-honoring. But like we talked about a few weeks ago, let's not miss the point. The kingdom is not about a product. It's about people. We can't control every condition, and we, we don't do this alone. So we can just faithfully do our part and allow God to do his. Like the psalmist wrote, cease striving and know that he is God, that he will be exalted among the nations. He will be exalted among the earth. Jesus compared the kingdom of God to a farmer scattering seed and letting nature take its course. To a farmer who prepared his fields, but then with rhythm and patience went to sleep at night, rose in the morning, and watched God faithfully bring a crop ready to harvest. Kingdom growth can be facilitated, but it's not fabricated, at least not by us. And also, kingdom growth is expansive, but it's not always explosive. The second uh, parable in our passage this morning, and the third in Mark chapter 4, is another one that I think is, is likely familiar to many of us. It starts in verse 30. It says this, And he said, With what can we compare the kingdom of God? Or what parable shall we use for it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which, when sown on the ground, is the smallest of all the seeds on the earth. Yet, when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants and puts out large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. Now, I must admit, when I was thinking about this part of the passage, uh, at one point, uh, I got down a little bit of a rabbit hole. You know, I was thinking about, oh, you know, it'd be cool to throw a picture up on the screen that, you know, shows like a, a, a mustard plant in, in full bloom, you know, so we could kind of visualize what... Uh, what Jesus is talking about here. And so I figured I'd ask Sam's, buddy, Sam's buddies down at Google if they had any good photos. So I popped mustard plant into Google and started looking around. Well, I quickly learned um, there's a few different kinds of mustard plants, and they don't all look the same. And so then I was, wow, I wonder which one was Jesus talking about? Which one's native to that region? You know, oh, well, Google tells me that not everybody agrees about which one Jesus was talking about. Yeah, and there's a bunch of blogs and devotionals where folks are trying to explain this parable based on the various growth characteristics of these different plants. You know, this one grows super fast. This one is more like a weed and hard to control. This one's sort of spindly and not always the prettiest, but it grows. And I started thinking, man, I better get this right. I got to figure this out. Is it Salvador Parasica? Is it Brassica Nigra? Or is it Synapsis Alba that you were talking about, Lord? Like, you didn't give us the Latin name. This is all in Greek. I guess I'm going to have to call Adam. He's getting a master's in this sort of thing. Maybe he'll know. But then I remember the verse that comes right after this parable. Mark chapter 4, verse 33. With many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. Or the NIV says, as they were able to understand. Jesus didn't ask us to get a degree in botany so that we could understand these parables and what he was getting at. I don't think he asked anybody in the first century to do, this, do that either. He was speaking at their level, and he's speaking at ours too. So I stepped back for a second and was reminded, what Jesus is saying is more like this. See these seeds that you have in front of you? Take a look at them. Hold them in your hand. Look at how tiny they are. Just a few millimeters wide. When I picked up this bag of seed from Brett yesterday... He was telling me about the math that he did when he brought in the harvest this year. 
He said a 50 bag pound or a 50 pound bag of seed, it covers about two and a half acres. And this year he got about 220 bushels per acre of corn in dry weight. So that's about 550 bushels from one bag of seed. Roughly, a bushel is about 60 pounds. So we're talking about over 30,000 pounds of feed from one bag of seed. This is what the kingdom of God is like. 30,000 pounds from one bag. A plant large enough to provide shade for birds from the tiniest of seeds. The kingdom of God starts small, but then it expands. It expands to the point where there is room for everyone. Sometimes that takes time. Kingdom growth is always expansive, but it's not always explosive. You know, this, these days, we're kind of obsessed with the startup culture, right? These little companies, tech companies that explode in growth. But this isn't always how the kingdom of God works. Now, to be sure, the church has had radical periods of growth. We saw that in the book of Acts when we studied that last, last year, right? The early church exploded in the first century. And throughout history, there have certainly been periods of revival. And in our own individual lives, I'm sure we can point to periods where our walk with the Lord was dynamic and exciting. You know, where we felt like we hit these spiritual growth spurts. But there are other times where it's just a grind. When we are that farmer, in verse 27, going to bed at night, getting up in the morning, day in, day out, we're told the seed is growing, but we know not how. In those moments, we must press on. He is still present. He is still working. Despite what our heart tells us, as surely as the sun rises, the crop is still growing and there is a harvest coming. He is faithful. He who began a good work in you, however small it was, is faithful and will carry it on to completion. Kingdom growth is expansive. It goes from small to large, but it's not always explosive. See, to the first century Jews, it probably wasn't comparing the kingdom to this large, extensive shrub providing shade for all the birds of the air that was the surprising thing about the parable. I mean, they were expecting something big and glorious. They were expecting a Messiah, a king, who would establish his rule and reign in power. But they were expecting a more explosive entry, a more triumphant one, perhaps one with a bit of force. Not a kingdom with such a humble, unassuming beginning as a mustard seed. But it's this contrast that's the key to the parable. The contrast between the tiny beginning of the mustard seed and its final position as larger than all the other garden plants. That's the startling reality of the kingdom. William L. Lane writes it this way. He says, The kingdom's appearance may be characterized by weakness and apparent insignificance, but remember the mustard seed. The day will come when the kingdom of God will surpass in glory the mightiest kingdoms of the earth. For this is the consequence of God's sovereign action. The mustard seed is the word of God which possesses the power which will one day make all things new. When the glory of that manifestation breaks forth before men, they will be as startled as the man who considers the tiny mustard seed that becomes the mighty shrub. It's amazing, isn't it? the power that's wrapped up in these little seeds. But this is what the kingdom of God is like. And given that today is the first Sunday of Advent, I think that's an appropriate thought to close on. Because a couple thousand years ago, a great deal of power and potential was wrapped up in something, rather someone, seemingly small and insignificant. He was just a baby boy wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. But in him, all the fullness of the deity dwelled. And this boy would grow up in a blue-collar family from Nazareth. Not exactly the royal upbringing that the Jews might have expected. And he would le- lead an itinerant ministry. Foxes had holes and the, and the birds had nests, but the Son of Man had no place to lay his head. He came to his own people, but they did not know him. They would not receive him. 
Ultimately, they rejected him and the kingdom that he promised to bring. And then they killed him. But before they did, he said, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. And just like in the spring, Brett will take this seed and will plant it in the ground, and then it will spring to life. Our Lord was buried, and he rose again, so we could have new life with him. Let's pray. Come, thou long-expected Jesus, born to set thy people free. From our fears and sins release us. Let us find our rest in thee. Israel's strength and consolation, hope of all the earth thou art, dear desire of every nation, joy of every longing heart. Born thy people to deliver, born a child and yet a king, born to reign in us forever, now thy gracious kingdom bring. By thine own eternal spirit, rule in all our hearts alone. By thine all-sufficient merit, raise us to thy glorious throne. Amen.